Neon Dynasty was the first return to the world of Kamigawa, a plane heavily influenced by feudal Japan. We first visited back in 2005 with Champions. During this and the following sets of betrayers and saviors, we would witness the conflict of the Kami War, wherein the spirits of Kamigawa were at war with the mortal inhabitants. The Kami were to reclaim Kiyodai, referred to as that which was taken, the soul of Kamigawa and the scion of Okagachi that was kidnapped by Konda Lord of Aiganjo. The strongest of the Kami were the Miyojin, powerful spirits who embodied the forces of the world. These beings were second only to Okagachi, and when the Kami War began, the mortals of Kamigawa prayed to the Miyojin. They were unaware of the crime committed by Konda, and as the other Kami of the plane had done so, the Miyojin too turned against the mortal world. Prior to this conflict, however, the denizens of Kamigawa revered the Kami, and to each of the five Miyojin, they built Hondins in their honor. In this video, I want to take a look into these Hondins and the subsequent shrine cycles that we would see. I would largely consider the five original Honden cards to be the strongest cycle of the Shrine family, with no downsides to their abilities. Each of these, though, have abilities that trigger at the beginning of your upkeep, and they increase their power as more Shrines exist. We would not see another cycle of Shrine cards until Core Set 2021. While the set does not specifically take place on Kamigawa, these cards do in fact exist on Kamigawa. They have substantially less lore detailed about them, but this cycle also introduces the first five-colored shrine, the Sanctum of All. This shrine not only allows you to tutor for another shrine from either your graveyard or the library at each upkeep, but should you have at least six or more shrines in play, your shrine abilities trigger an additional time. This cycle of shrines also each have flavor text that is formatted to read as a haiku. Three of the five monocolored shrines have abilities that trigger at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, and other two have abilities that trigger at any time. That being said, this cycle does contain what I consider to be the least powerful ability on Sanctum of Shattered Heights. The third cycle is from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, released in 2022. These new shrines have the additional properties of being enchantment creatures. They each have a keyword ability reflective of their color. They also have abilities that trigger at the beginning of your end step, allowing you to pay one mana of any color to use an ability that scales based on the number of shrines you control. It's also important to note that the creatures in this cycle have no creature type, as shrine is an enchantment type and not a creature type. Each of the shrines from Neon Dynasty also have a backstory to their creation. Goshintai of Shared Purpose a group of farmers in rural Kamigawa found themselves in grave danger when a nearby river threatened to overflow and flood their town. Seeking divine aid, they built a small shrine as an offering and attracted a kami of shared purpose. The kami instructed them on how to work together and dig trenches for irrigation, and when the waters came, the waters grew instead of drowning. Impressed by the people's performance, the kami chose to take permanent residence in the shrine, lending its magic to the town forever. Go Shintai of Lost Wisdom Long ago, an ambitious professor at Minamo Academy believed she could learn all the secrets of the universe if she could simply channel the correct kami. The little shrine she built intrigued a kami of lost wisdom. The curious kami shared its knowledge with the professor, including when and how she would die. Offended by the information, the professor asked her newfound revelation to be removed. The kami obliged, but it still resides in the shrine to this day, teasing travelers with impossible riddles. Goshintai of Hidden Cruelty A young ogre was evicted from her cave by a violent warlord. The ogre had seen her people use little shrines to summon Oni, so she figured she could summon a kami who would provide a solution to her homelessness. Her struggle inadvertently summoned a kami of Hidden Cruelty. The kami whispered angry, vengeful thoughts in the ogre's ear until she took up arms and murdered the warlord. Shocked at what she'd done, the ogre fled, but the kami remained in the shrine, offering vengeance with those with darkness in their hearts. Go Shintai of Boundless Vigor A young monk was forced out of Jukai Forest by Towashi's urban expansion. To preserve the memory of his homeland, he built a small shrine around a seed from his destroyed garden. Miraculously, the seed grew without soil and became the kami of Boundless Vigor. Together, the kami and monk reclaimed his section of the forest. Every tree cut down magically grew back the next day. Before he passed, the monk moved to the Kami Shrine into the reborn forest where it lives to this day, granting strength to those whose wild nature cannot be tamed by the city. 
This cycle also brought with it, for the first time, a technical five-color sixth creature, Goshintai of Life's Origin. Few have seen Akami die, but it is possible. A number crumbled into dust when the Jukai Forest was decimated during the expansion of Tawashi. However, the dust settled on an ancient shrine in the heart of the forest and began to coalesce into something new. The shrine took on a life and Kami powers of its own. This new spirit continues to wander throughout Kamigawa, growing stronger as it's joined by the remains of other deceased Kami. Goshintai of Life's Origin, who brings with them a five-color activated ability, brings at last a valid commander for a shrine-centric deck. One of the benefits of our commanders, whenever another shrine enters the battlefield, it creates an additional 1-1 shrine enchantment creature token. This does include itself, so our shrine count will go up a lot quicker as we play more shrines. This deck will focus on enchantments, specifically the shrine enchantments, which give various effects, scaling as we have more shrines on our battlefield. Our commander carries a unique activated ability that can bring enchantments back from the graveyard, giving us a good quality recursion. This deck has a powerful card draw engine that we can use to maintain good resources and card advantage while maintaining control over the board. To begin, we do run all 15 of the mono-colored shrines. I will break these down into the three main cycles so we can look at what they do. We're going to begin with the Hondens. Honden of Cleansing Fire will buffer our life total, so even if we are unable to ward off attacks at us, we can still easily boost our life total back to healthy levels. Honden of Infinite Rage lets us burn a creature or player, which can either act as a threat to life totals or as creature removal. This one is something I like to hold back until late game, where I will have a greater number of shrines in play. Honden of Life's Web is one I like to get out as early as I can, despite it having the most expensive mana value of this cycle. Getting spirit tokens for each shrine I control can easily start giving us some blockers. Honden of Knight's Reach can be devastating to an opponent should we have assembled enough shrines. It would be very unfortunate to entirely wipe out an opponent's hand at every upkeep. Honden of Seeing Winds gives us a card draw for each shrine we control. We can easily start giving us a ton of cards once we get going. Now on to the Sanctums. Sanctum of Tranquil Light is the cheapest to cast of any shrine, and while that 6 mana activated ability might seem intimidating, we only need to get a few shrines in play before it only costs 1 mana per target. Do keep in mind this is an ability we can activate multiple times per turn, so we can use it offensively during our turns to tap down blockers, or during the off turns where we can defensively tap down threats. Sanctum of Fruitful Harvest is one of our sources of ramp, giving us more mana to cast more shrines. Keep in mind this mana is only usable during that pre-combat main phase, and it's only one color we can add. Sanctum of Calm Waters is reminiscent of the Honden of Seeing Winds, letting us draw cards for the number of shrines we control, but if we do, we have to discard a single card. It's not the worst drawback once we can draw into multiple cards, and with how much card draw this deck can generate, I'm never concerned about discarding anything. Sanctum of Shattered Heights, as I said before, is perhaps the least powerful of the shrines, letting you discard a card that's either a land or a shrine to burn a creature or planeswalker. It does allow for repeat uses, but I have actually seen some list cut this card for its lack of utility. Sanctum of Stone Fangs is perhaps the most powerful of the shrines, letting you burn each opponent for the number of shrines you control while also gaining you life. Once you start getting more shrines out and putting up some additional defenses that we'll talk about later, it is going to be hard for your opponents to interrupt your momentum. Lastly, Sanctum of All acts as a tutor for your shrines, letting you bring one to the battlefield every turn from either your graveyard or from the library, offering you a tremendous amount of flexibility. It also becomes a panharmonicon style effect once you amass six or more shrines. This is relatively easy to do considering our commander also makes shrine enchantment tokens. Next comes the Goshintai cycle, which all allow you at the end step to pay one mana to activate their abilities, which all scale based on your shrine count. Goshintai of Boundless Vigors plus plus one plus one counters onto a target shrine. Goshintai of Ancient Wars burns a target player or planeswalker. Goshintai of Lost Wisdom mills a target player, which I will also note can be yourself. Our commander can reanimate enchantments. It's not always a bad thing to mill your own library. Goshintai of Hidden Cruelty destroys a creature with toughness equal to or less than your shrine count. And then lastly, Goshintai of Shared Purpose creates 1-1 spirit tokens based on your shrine count. 
We do have to keep in mind that these are all enchantments, so our next section is going to talk about cards that will benefit from us playing enchantments. Obviously, the forefront group would be our enchantresses, our Gothian enchantress, Eidolon of Blossoms, Mesa enchantress, Verderan enchantress, Cetessian champion, Satyr enchanter, enchantress's presence, and Sithis harvest hands. These each will draw you a card whenever you cast an enchantment, and for the Satessan Champion and Eidolon of Blossoms, they're going to trigger whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield. That's a distinction you will need to keep in mind, as we do have some instances of enchantments coming into play from abilities that don't get the cast triggers. I also included Grim Guardian for its ping ability. Having multiple enchantments coming into play will mean players will start taking damage quicker. Doomwake Giant also acts as a board wipe for opponents as creatures, and remember that these are on enchantments entering the battlefield. Sigil Event Be Thrown and Archon of Sun's Grace both give us creature tokens for our enchantments, with the Sigil giving us a 4-4 Flying Angel upon casting enchantments, and the Archon giving us a 2-2 Flying and Lifelink Pegasus upon enchantments entering the battlefield. I also have an assortment of value enchantments that I think just bring good abilities to the table. Destiny Spinner protects my enchantments and creatures from counter magic and can even animate a land to be pretty big and trampoly. Dryad of the Elysian Grove gives me an additional land drop and makes my lands count as every basic land type, acting as a much better chromatic lantern. Sanctum Weaver is a budget friendly Sarah Sanctum and counts itself towards the enchantment count. Weaver of Harmony is a neat little tech that pumps up my enchantment creatures, which includes the creature shrines and the shrine tokens made by our commander. I also really like that for one green mana we can copy a triggered or activated ability from an enchantment. Alongside this is a small but effective group of cards poised to control our opponents. Stony Silence shuts off all mana rocks, and because the only artifact that we run in the entire deck is the obligatory soul ring, we are minimally phased by this. Sterling Grove gives our enchantment Shroud, and when I need to tutor for an enchantment, it can be sacrificed to do so in a pinch. Smothering Tithe is Smothering Tithe. I know I said I only one run artifact, but at this point it's additional value that will severely inhibit our opponent's use of their resources. Ristic Study, I've contemplated cutting just based on how much card draw the deck can generate, but I feel like it's a good deterrent to removal by drawing any hate to itself. Preserve the Shrines, that's the deck's goal. This is also why we run Privileged Position, which acts in the same vein as Sterling Grove by giving everything I control hexproof. Blind Obedience is here to inhibit further opponents' moves by tapping down their creatures and their artifacts. Aura Shards is also here, a great card in conjunction with my token-producing shrines to clean up opponents' artifacts and enchantments. Because of how many enchantments this deck runs, I think Sphere of Safety speaks for itself as a tremendous Pill of Fort card. Last, and perhaps the most niche card in the deck, is Omniscience. This is my end all for the deck and perhaps the most blatant win con that we run. If this card makes its way into the graveyard, you can easily bring it back using our commander, and then everything you cast will be cast for free. This is actually the card I have in mind for milling myself using the blue Go Shintai, and if you can get this out, it's game over for your opponents. You could also run in Tomb, but I chose not to. The end goal of the deck is to amass value using the various shrine abilities, padding our life total, depriving our opponents of their resources and their ability to do anything, assembling a large enough offensive force with our tokens to swing for the win. It's a very passive battlecruiser style deck, but runs enough control and removal to really keep opponents off their game. For the full deck list, which also includes the mana base and other cards not listed here, you can check out the Moxfield link down and below in the description. Again, the mana base is where the bulk of the budget cuts can be made, as you can always run more basics and really whatever kind of lands that you have. The important thing to note with this deck is it's heavily into white and green in spite of it being 5 color. I hope you enjoyed this look at my Shrine Commander deck. If you did, I would appreciate a like and subscribe, and I hope to see you next time.